The 3D models in this video were made by Kuzim, or Adam Midzuk, and the animations were made by Tyler Addison. Their socials will be included in the description and the comment section below. Sauropods are pretty boring. They stayed the same for over 100 million years till they got smacked to death by a super fast space ball rock. Tiny heads, long necks, long tails, rotund bodies, and four columnar legs. Well, for the most part. The parts that changed between the different lineages of long necked leviathans were the backbones. Everything from the base of the skull to the tip of the tail differed from one species to the next. One of the most extreme variations on the long-necked body plan is seen in the Dicreosauridae group. These guys were an offshoot of the larger Diplodocoid sauropod group, which is made up of mostly the thinner-built Diplodocids with the extreme tail and neck lengths, and the shorter, squatter Apatosaurs. The Dicreosaurids differed from all other sauropod dinosaurs in having rather short necks and small body sizes. Above all, all the vertebrae before the pelvis sprouted into two vertebral spines, neural arches, or what is scientifically called hemispinous processes. These guys are known from the late Jurassic to the late Cretaceous and from the US to Argentina to Tanzania and China. Some didn't have very long spines, but many did, like Amargosaurus, Pilmatoya, and Bajonosaurus. The exact significance and use of these spines have been talked about countless times over the decades. Some researchers have hypothesized they were used as a support structure for a padded crest or sail for display, while other researchers hypothesize a bison-like hump made by muscles and soft tissues. Still, more have suggested the spines remained unconnected to one another and were covered in a keratin sheath. Pilmatoya is extremely fragmentary, and the crest of spines that may have extended to cover the entire neck region was one of the shortest of the spiny dicreosaurs, so we can ignore it for now. Bajatosaurus is known from a skull and a few bits of vertebrae, so it can also be ignored for now. Amargosaurus is the only one known from relatively complete remains, including much of the neck vertebrae. It therefore offers the best look at this entire subgroup of a group of a group of long necks. Amargosaurus was described in 1991 by a team of researchers including Leonardo Salgado and Jose Bonaparte from a single, nearly complete skeleton found in the Neoquien province of Argentina back in 1984. It is distinct for having super elongated spiny bits of its vertebrae forming a crest of backward pointing spikes along the neck, which transitioned into double pronged hockey stick style spines on the back that then transitioned into singular paddle shaped spines at the mid back before again transitioning into normal neural spines at the tail. This singular specimen may have been up to 9 to 10 meters, 30 to 33 feet in length, making it one of the smallest sauropod dinosaurs. Another hallmark of its group. Paleontologist Jack Bailey published a study in 1997 about the possible appearance and use of the Amargosaurus spines. His study concluded that it was more likely that Amargosaurus sported a short sail of skin on the neck area that would have connected each of the spines into a double crest, followed by a thick hump of fat like that of the modern bison attached to the double-pronged vertebrae of the front of the back and the paddle-shaped spines of the middle back and pelvis. In this scenario, the neck sails would be especially useful as a display structure to friends and foes while the hump would help the animal store fat, maintain its body temperature through gigantothermy, and dissipate heat when out in sunny areas. That was the norm for a while. I'm sure most of us recall growing up with the double-crested reconstruction of this wacky dinosaur. I know I did. I'm particularly reminiscing about this dramatic piece by Louis Ray. Then, in 2007, Daniela Schwarz, Eberhard Frey, and Christian Mayer published a paper on the soft tissue reconstructions and the holiness of the diplodocid and dicreosaurid sauropods, offering a different hypothesis. 
This study proposed that the super-elongated thin spines of Amargosaurus were partially sheathed in a keratin covering. Their reasoning behind this covering was the presence of striations in the outermost two-thirds of the spines, which are similar to those striations seen in the bony core of the horns of bovids, which are covered in a sheath of keratin. The striations act as holdfasts for the different tissues involved in keratin development to attach to. Unfortunately, this study did not provide a huge, elaborate, detailed overview of these striations, so something like histology could not be considered. A similar keratin sheath was hypothesized to cover the forward-facing spines of Bajatosaurus. The researchers who described Bajatosaurus did not find the same kind of striations discovered for the spines of Amargosaurus, and their reasoning for the keratin sheath hypothesis for Bajatosaurus was that the spines were super long. Assumedly too long to be tied up in a fleshy sail crest. A keratin sheath could help protect the spines from snapping. As such, all past research on the spines of the super spiny sauropod dinosaurs has been based on observations rather than more direct methods. One of the strongest tests to do on bones these days is histology. The study of microscopic tissues in bone and other bodily tissues in living and extinct organisms. The process for fossils is simple. Slice through the bone to create a thin cross-section of the bone thin enough to fit to a glass microscope slide. Polish as necessary, adhere to the slide, place under the scope, and finally, describe and observe what structures are seen under different wavelengths of light. These internal structures can provide information on the animal's diet, ecology, age, environment, relationships with soft tissues, buoyancy, function of soft tissues, and much more. A March 2022 study by Ignacio Cerda, Fernando Novas, José Luis Carballido, and Leonardo Salgado, published in the Anatomical Society's Journal of Anatomy, provided the first histological analysis of the bones of Amargosaurus, and therefore of any of the spined dicreosaurids. There have been previous histology studies on the spines of edaphosaurids and sphenacodontids, but these critters were basal synapsids and not really closely related to our back-swept spined friend. The primary goal of this research on Amargosaurus was to obtain evidence to test the many previous hypotheses proposed for the appearance and function of the soft tissues that attached to the spines. The first thing the team did was reanalyze the external anatomy of the spines of Amargosaurus. In this first analysis, it was found that the outside of the spines have been partially eroded and or covered in plaster. That's obviously going to obscure the anatomy of the bone in a few areas. The best bits show that the spines are usually smooth in texture with some variation here and there. One major variation is some ridges and furrows going up the spine. These may be what were referred to as striations in previous analyses. The new team found that the majority of them could only be attributed to breakage of the bone after the death of the animal. There were some low-relief ridges on the ends and middle of two of the vertebrae, which could not be confidently attributed to breakage after death. These were not elaborated on, but probably do not represent the striations. Here you can see the many cross-sections made of the vertebrae. The shape of the vertebral spines differs between spines and between points in the spines. There are round, rhomboidal, hook, and triangular cross-sections. These bones were made pretty much completely of a type of bone called compact bone tissue. This is hard stuff. The spongy texture belongs to cancellous bone. Cancellous bone is absent in the end and middle sections of one vertebra, but in others there's only a thin layer of hard bone, while the inside is caked up with that spongy bone that'll trigger your trypophobia. All in all, the main bone of the spines is heavily vascularized. It's invaded by, like, just a ton of blood vessels. The cross-section histology also found a bunch of cyclical growth marks. These marks are deposited in the layers of bone each year as an animal grows. Many times, the yearly layer gets absorbed. Therefore, the ones left behind, unabsorbed, are those that mark particularly harsh times. 
as the bone did not grow much before hitting a period of years of growth that fused together, and so on and so forth. From there, the researchers described the details of Sharpie's fibers, or the matrix of connective tissue made of strong bundles of collagen fibers. It connects periosteum to bone. They also describe in detail the secondary bone and bone modeling found from different wavelengths of light through the thin sections of the bones. So, what's the deal? What does the analysis mean? Conclusions? Spines? The new analysis of histology of the spines plus a reanalysis of the external anatomy has allowed for the first time in Amerigosaurus research history the ability to more rigidly characterize the spines and how they may have worked in the body when the animal was alive. So, the latest interpretation of the spines is that they were covered in keratin whether for most of their length or for the last two-thirds to last third. This hypothesis was based on a single feature, those supposed striations on the upper parts of the spines. As this study shows, those striations aren't really all that prevalent. Not prevalent enough to really support the keratin sheath hypothesis, and with the combination of histology can now be more or less ruled out. Oddly enough, striations are still a supportive piece of evidence for the presence of keratin sheaths in other animals, even other extinct animals. It's just a little too ambiguous here in Amargosaurus. Sales? Humps? Yes, please. Now we're back to the old hypothesis. The spines were connected to one another via thin to thick skin and ligaments with the thicker vertebrae of the back being the armature for a fat-storing hump. This sort of structure has been inferred for many other extinct animals, specifically the tall-spined Cynapsids, Edaphosaurus, Dimetrodon, and relatives, as well as some amphibians, like Platyhistrix. Some histology studies have been done on these ancient animals, with ambiguous to sturdy results, but at this point it would still be quite unlikely for them to just be carrying around a crest of spines. Sharpie's fibers were found on the lateral and medial sides of the middle of the neck spines. Now, the presence of these fibers doesn't inherently indicate a specific type of soft tissue, and definitely not muscle, but it does strongly indicate the presence of some kind of soft tissue. Their presence on the sides and the front of the spines therefore suggests the spines were connected to one another with some kind of tissue. Their orientation on the spines suggested to the authors that there may have been some sort of interspinous ligaments that connected the spines. This is a little different than muscles or just skin, as ligaments would be the stretchy tissues that linked each spine together to allow a sort of stretchy shock absorber as the animal moved and moved its neck. It may have also allowed the animal to keep its neck at a certain angle, or to snap its neck up quickly, or to just keep its neck in position, as in the giraffe. But there is a lack of hard or direct evidence of these ligaments on the bones. But like all animals have ligaments in their neck, it's just a matter of how extensive they were in the neck of a Margosaurus. Another interesting possibility is that the long spines were more for dissipating or absorbing the stress created by tensile forces from the ligaments between the spines, which would explain the lack of ligament scars left on the bones. The shock absorbing thing pretty much stops scars from happening, which wouldn't give us any evidence of their presence. This is a similar thing to what has been proposed for short spined spinosaurs like Baryonyx. Unfortunately, that's about it. The evidence found by the analysis doesn't really allow you to say for certain exactly what the animal was using its double or fused singular sail or crest for. That may not be entirely possible to definitively prove anyway. So out with the new and in with the old. Old is new again. No one's ever really gone. Sail necked Amargosaurus lives. What do you think it was using its neck crest for? Was it two separate sails, or did they morph together with meat, like in this one by Gabriel Igueto? Let me know in the comments section below. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, hit the bell icon for updates, like this video, and drop a comment in the comments section below. Thanks for watching. 
Special thanks to my elephant tier patrons, Ray, Isaiah Garza, Dinosaur, Christoph Hubbinger, Biotiverse, and Arda Bayer. And another thanks to my Tyrannosaurus tier patrons, The Dogman, Iron Bladesman, Danny Van Heck, and Dana Manchester.